Let's get right into it. Number 8. The 3 Second Goldfish There's a good chance someone has insulted your memory by comparing it to a goldfish. The myth is so ingrained in our culture that it's practically a scientific law. A goldfish swims around its bowl, sees a little plastic castle, thinks, wow, a castle. And then three seconds later, sees the same castle and thinks, whoa, a brand new castle. It's a tragic Sisyphean loop of discovery and immediate amnesia, turning their tiny glass homes into an endless M.C. Escher painting of forgetfulness. It makes you feel a little bad for them these perpetually bewildered, glittery water bricks. Except, it's complete nonsense. The idea of a three-second memory is an urban legend so potent, it probably convinced itself it was real. Scientists, who apparently have a lot of time on their hands and a deep-seated need to defend the intellectual honor of aquarium pets, have thoroughly debunked this. In studies, goldfish have been trained to associate specific sounds with feeding time. Not only did they remember the sounds for weeks, but they could even distinguish between different sounds. One Australian study trained goldfish to come for food at the sound of a specific tone. Months later, when the researchers played the tone again, the fish remembered and swam right over, presumably expecting a snack and being very disappointed by the lack of scientific funding for post-experiment treats. They can recognize their owners, learn to navigate mazes, and even remember which little plastic hoop to swim through for a reward. They're basically tiny, wet puppies who can recognize the giant food god who appears above their tank every morning. So the next time someone calls you a goldfish, thank them for recognizing your surprisingly robust long-term memory. And then immediately forget you had this conversation, just to mess with them. Number 7. Blind as a bat. You've heard the expression, blind as a bat. It's our go-to metaphor for someone who can't see the gigantic obstacle directly in their path. We picture bats as these chaotic, furry little sky missiles flailing through the night, using their fancy sonar purely because their eyes are just useless, painted on dots, a flappy, furry pinball of incompetence, bouncing off cave walls and accidentally flying into your hair because it mistook your head for a particularly dense patch of night. It's a compelling image of nature's adorable fallibility. But here's the thing. Not a single one of the over 1-400 species of bat is blind. Not one. In fact, some of them can see better than you can, especially the large fruit bats, also known as megabats, which have big, well-developed eyes perfect for spotting a tasty mango in the moonlight. The smaller bats, the microbats, do have smaller eyes, but they are fully functional. They can see just fine, thank you very much. So why the echolocation? Is it just for showing off? Well, kind of. Echolocation isn't a replacement for sight, it's an upgrade. It's like having military-grade night vision and also sonar. They're not disabled. They're ridiculously over-equipped. They use their eyes for navigating long distances and seeing larger objects, but when they're hunting tiny, fast-moving insects in total darkness, eyesight is like trying to catch a fly with a telescope. Echolocation gives them a ridiculously detailed 3D acoustic map of their surroundings, allowing them to snag a mosquito out of midair. So, a bat isn't a blind creature fumbling in the dark. It's a tactical night ops mammal with more sensory input than your brain could handle before it blue screened. Number six, the ostrich headberry. The cartoon trope is legendary. An ostrich faced with mild inconvenience, a predator, or perhaps just a socially awkward situation, immediately plunges its head deep into the sand. It's the ultimate symbol of denial. An animal so terrified of reality that it opts for a strategy of, if I can't see the lion, the lion can't see me. It's an idea so beautifully stupid we've all accepted it as fact. We imagine this giant bird, its massive, feathery body sticking straight up out of the ground, completely exposed, convinced it has achieved perfect camouflage. This, of course, is a hilarious and complete fabrication. Ostriches have survived for millions of years, and they didn't do it by being the dumbest animal on the savanna. They are 200-pound, 9-foot-tall birds that can run at 45 miles per hour and deliver a kick powerful enough to unalive a lion. Plunging their head into the ground would be like a heavyweight boxer dealing with a problem by sticking his fingers in his ears and humming loudly. So where did this myth come from? It's a simple misunderstanding of perfectly normal bird behavior. Ostriches dig shallow holes in the ground for their nests. They use their beaks to turn their eggs several times a day to ensure they're evenly heated. From a distance, this giant bird lowering its long neck and head into a hole looks exactly like it's trying to become one with the Earth's core. They also swallow sand and pebbles to help grind up food in their stomachs. So they're either being responsible parents or eating rocks to help their digestion. You know, normal bird stuff. It's not an act of cowardice. 
It's an act of either home renovation or questionable dietary choices. Basically, the ostrich isn't an idiot, it's just multitasking. Number five, the tainted baby bird. This one is a classic piece of childhood trauma delivered with the best of intentions. You find a tiny, helpless baby bird that has fallen out of its nest. Your first instinct is to gently pick it up and place it back where it belongs. But then an adult swoops in, physically and metaphorically, to warn you. Don't touch it. If you get your human scent on it, the mother will smell you and abandon her baby forever. And just like that, you are paralyzed with fear, convinced that your touch is a mark of death, a toxic contamination that will orphan this poor creature. You back away slowly, leaving the bird to its fate, your heart heavy with the burden of your foul-smelling humanity. This myth is designed to keep kids from meddling with wildlife, which is a noble goal. The problem is the reasoning is pure fiction. Most birds have a terrible sense of smell. Seriously, it's garbage. Birds like vultures have a keen sense of smell to find rotting carcasses from miles away. But for your average songbird, their olfactory abilities are about as developed as your ability to understand quantum physics. They navigate the world primarily through sight and sound. A mother bird is not going to detect the faint, lingering scent of your Cheeto-dusted fingers and decide to disown her offspring. Her parental instincts are incredibly strong. She has invested a huge amount of energy into laying eggs and raising her young, and she's not going to throw all that away because her kid briefly had a close encounter with a giant bipedal ape. In reality, if you find a baby bird on the ground and you can safely return it to its nest, you absolutely should. The mother bird will be too busy being relieved to care that her child now smells faintly of hand sanitizer and existential dread. Number four, toads give you warts. It's a playground superstition as old as time. You see a lumpy, bumpy toad hopping across the sidewalk, and the bravest kid in your group dares you to pick it up. Everyone else shrieks in horror, warning you that if its warty skin touches yours, you'll be cursed with a crop of hideous warts on your hands. The toad becomes a tiny, amphibious biohazard, a purveyor of folkloric dermatology. The lumpy texture of its skin is just too similar to the ailment it supposedly causes, and our brains, loving a good pattern, connect the dots with the confidence of a conspiracy theorist. But toads are getting a bad rap. The bumps on a toad's skin are not warts. They are glands, many of which secrete toxins to make the toad taste absolutely disgusting to predators. They are a defense mechanism, not a contagious skin condition. Warts, on the other hand, are caused by a virus, specifically the human papillomavirus, or HPV. There are over a hundred strains of HPV, and some of them cause the benign skin growths we call warts. You get them from contact with the virus, which can be on surfaces or passed from person to person, not from an innocent amphibian who is just trying to get to a nice, damp log. So, unless a toad has somehow contracted a human virus, then licked its own back, and then you decided to rub that specific spot all over an open cut on your hand, you are not getting warts from a toad. It has absolutely nothing to do with them. Blaming toads for warts is like blaming your dog for giving you a sunburn. You're pointing the finger at a convenient, nearby suspect while the real culprit, a microscopic, invisible entity, gets away with it. Let the toads live in peace. They have enough problems, what with being famously unattractive and all. Number three, the deadliest spider. Ah, the daddy long legs, the spindly awkward tenant living rent-free in the corners of your ceiling. You've probably been told the story, a chilling piece of bar trivia that makes you eye that delicate arachnid with a newfound sense of terror. The legend goes that the Daddy Long Legs is the most venomous spider in the world, possessing a poison so potent it could take down a water buffalo. But the story concludes with a comforting little asterisk. We're safe because their fangs are too small and weak to actually pierce human skin. We are spared from their apocalyptic venom purely because of an evolutionary design flaw. It's a great story. It's got danger, irony, and a happy ending for us. And it's wrong on pretty much every level. First, the term daddy long legs is used to describe at least three different creatures, and only one of them is a true spider. There are harvestmen, which are arachnids but not spiders, and have no venom glands at all. Then there are crane flies, which are insects and are about as dangerous as a piece of lint. Finally, there are fulcid spiders, the cellar spiders that build messy webs in your basement. These are the ones the myth is usually about. So are they secretly packing god-tier venom? The show Mythbusters famously tackled this. They managed to get a cellar spider to bite one of the hosts, proving that their fangs can pierce human skin, though it's difficult. The result of the bite? A tiny prick and a very mild, short-lived burning sensation. That's it. 
Subsequent chemical analyses of their venom have confirmed it's laughably weak, especially compared to actual heavy hitters like the Black Widow. The Daddy Long Legs isn't a hyper-lethal assassin with a design flaw. It's a harmless, slightly goofy roommate whose only crime is being kinda creepy looking. Number 2. The Piranha Feeding Frenzy Close your eyes and picture it. You're in the Amazon. You fall into the water. The moment your body hits the surface, the river begins to boil. A cloud of razor-toothed fury converges on you from all directions. Within seconds, the water is a crimson froth, and in under a minute, all that's left is a perfectly clean skeleton sinking gently to the riverbed. This is the image of the piranha seared into our collective consciousness by horror movies and sensationalized documentaries. They are the ultimate aquatic nightmare, a swarm of living blenders. The truth is far less cinematic. This entire myth can be traced back to one man, Theodore Roosevelt. During his trip to the Amazon in 1913, local fishermen wanted to put on a good show for the former U.S. president. So they cordoned off a section of the river with nets and packed it with hundreds of piranhas. They then starved them for days. When Roosevelt arrived, they tossed a dead cow into the water, and the terrified, starving fish went absolutely berserk, stripping it to the bone in a spectacular display of ferocity. Roosevelt wrote about it, the story spread, and the piranha's reputation as a bloodthirsty monster was born. In reality, piranhas are primarily scavengers, feeding on dead or dying animals, supplemented with a diet of seeds and plants. They are generally timid fish. While they do have sharp teeth and can deliver a nasty bite if provoked, or if food is incredibly scarce, the idea of them hunting down and skeletonizing a healthy human is pure fantasy. There are records of people swimming in piranha-infested waters for centuries with no issue. They're less like a pack of wolves and more like a flock of very nervous aquatic vultures with a bad publicist. Number 1. The Lemming Death March This is the granddaddy of all nature myths, a story so tragic and bizarre it feels like it has to be true. The lemmings, small, hamster-like rodents of the Arctic tundra, are said to be gripped by a strange collective madness. When their populations boom, they are driven by an unknown instinct to form a massive army and march in a straight line, inexorably, towards the sea. Upon reaching a cliff, they don't stop. They just keep going one after another, plunging into the cold, churning waters below in a horrifying act of mass suicide. It's a powerful metaphor for mindless conformity and self-destruction. It's also one of the most infamous hoaxes in the history of wildlife filmmaking. The entire myth was cemented in the public mind by the 1958 Disney documentary, White Wilderness. The film shows dozens of lemmings cascading off a cliff into the ocean, and the narrator solemnly confirms their suicidal journey. But the filmmakers cheated. The documentary was filmed in Alberta, Canada, a landlocked province with no native lemming populations and certainly no nearby ocean. The crew bought the lemmings from local kids, put them on a spinning turntable to create a sense of frantic disorientation, and then literally herded them off a cliff into a river. So what do lemmings actually do? Their populations do experience dramatic boom and bust cycles. During a boom, the sheer number of lemmings forces them to migrate in search of food and space. They will cross rivers and streams in their path, and some will inevitably drown or fall from ledges by accident. But there is no suicidal intent. There is no death wish. It's just a crowded migration where accidents happen. They are not mindless drones marching to their doom. They are victims of overpopulation, bad luck, and a 1950s film crew with a shockingly flexible definition of the word documentary. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.